welcome to uh, Wildfire Blazing. Uh, my name is Angela McGill, and I have the privilege of leading uh, this amazing ministry uh, called Wildfire Blazing Church. And so I'm excited this morning um, just to talk about from the standpoint of this morning, we're going to be talking about evicting the spirit of fear, evicting the spirit of fear. And so I hope you guys can hear me this morning. Uh, we're going to be coming from 1 Kings uh, 18 this morning. Sorry, trying to turn the volume down on the microphone. Uh, but we're going to be coming from 1 Kings 18 this morning. And so uh, I'm excited to talk about if you're joining us for the first time uh, the past couple weeks, we've been talking about Let It Burn. And uh, that's from a book I released uh, last year called Let It Burn, Cultivating a Fire on the Inside of You That Never Goes Out. And so we talked about that the past few weeks. And I talked about that according to Luke 49, we believe that Jesus said that he came to ignite a fire on the earth. And then he said how he wished that the fire was already kindled. And so the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about the topic of fire, uh, i.e. the ministry is called Wildfire Blazing Church. And it is founded on Luke 12, 49, that we believe uh, that God has called us to spread the fire of God. We believe that fire consists of God's presence. Uh, we don't want to do anything without God. Uh, God's passion. There is a passion that the Father can give you from heaven. And God's purity is that we want our hearts to look like him, right? We have a lot of people um, that are representing Christ, right? But they don't look like him. It's one thing to talk the talk. It's another thing to walk the walk. And so uh, Wildfire Blazing Church is founded on those three things. God's presence, God's passion, and God's purity. And so the past couple weeks, we've been talking about that. This week, I want to kind of shift gears. Of course, we're always going to be talking about the fire of God. But this week, I want to shift gears, and I want to talk from 1 Kings 18. God has really uh, been dealing with me on the spirit of fear. And it's one thing, um, if you go back to March or even February, when this whole COVID coronavirus uh, you know, uh, was in China and then it started spreading all across the world. One of the tactics of the enemy was he released the spirit of fear, right? And so a lot of people started finding themselves dealing with different levels of fear that they've never dealt with before. And then people who already were struggling with fear found themselves in deeper levels of fear, right? Struggling with different kinds of fear. And so I really want, of course, we are way past February. We are in July. Uh, but with the uprising and downrising, there are still people struggling with fear, not just with COVID. Some people are just dealing with fear because they lost their jobs. Some people are dealing with fear because they're stuck in the house and they're not used to uh, being by themselves, right? And so there is a level of anxiety and paranoia that goes with I'm not used to being by myself all the time, right? Because you just can't go bowling and things like that. There's limits on it if you're in Texas and you got to wear a mask. And some people are dealing with anxiety just because they're having to wear a mask all the time, right? And so I really want to deal with the spirit of fear. Uh, if you've watched the past couple weeks, you have seen me uh, really preach, right? Because I have a passion for the fire of God. I am going to be in a different setting today. I'm going to, I'm going to pull, pull on the teacher within me because one of the things is preaching is amazing and I love preaching and it's the motivation and the drive to continue to draw us closer to the Father. But one of the things why I really love teaching is, is you give people principles, you give them knowledge, and then they're able to take it and walk away with something hopefully practical that they can apply to their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, I have been posting this on Facebook. It is, it is a topic that I am passionate about, that it does no good to talk to talk, right? There are a lot of people who love deep revelation. They want to jump into to great theology, right? The study of God. They want the mysteries of God revealed. And I am the same way, like I want it. But one of the things I never want to be found guilty of 
is, is getting deep revelation and the mysteries of God are revealed and there's great, the spirit of revelation is upon me and then Monday I am down depressed and in anxiety and I can't function. What good is the deep revelations if you're not going to walk it out? And so sometimes what I like to do is kind of slow down and go more in the teaching vein. And the reason I want to go in the teaching vein is because I want you to hear and understand what I'm saying. And then I want you to turn around and take what I'm giving you today and actually walk it out. Uh, I can talk about the spirit of fear because if you don't know my testimony, I have struggled with the spirit of fear um, literally since I can remember as a child all the way into my adulthood. And really, I would say at 31 is really where God eradicated the spirit of fear. And, and I knew it had broke off of my life once and for all. Doesn't mean that it doesn't try to come back. Uh, but it literally, God broke the spirit of fear up off of my life. And there was a part that I played in it. And I'm going to talk about that today. And so if you're listening to this and you're like, I don't really struggle with the spirit of fear. Let me, let me give you examples because some people don't know what is attached to the spirit of fear. And so if we look at it from the standpoint of an anxiety uh, that is attached to the spirit of fear. If you find yourself being anxious, the Bible says to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication to make your request unto the Lord. So God is already telling us that we are not to be anxious, right? So if you deal with an anxiety, that is attached to the spirit of fear. If you deal with paranoia, it is attached to the spirit of fear. What is paranoia? Sometimes you're thinking people are watching you. You're thinking, I've seen people deal with the spirit of paranoia because they think that, that somebody posted something on Facebook and they and they're like, oh, they're talking about me. Oh, they're talking about my friends. Oh, they're talking about the church. Oh, they're talking about leaders. No, maybe you deal with some paranoia. People are not, I know when it comes to me, I'm not thinking about anybody when I post. I'm not, I'm not five. I'm not posting stuff indirectly trying to attack someone. If I had something to say, I could easily just call you or message you. I'm not thinking about posting something indirectly. That is a sign of immaturity. And so sometimes people struggle struggle uh, with the spirit of paranoia because they're they're afraid that oh maybe someone's talking about me or maybe maybe they told someone about me and, and that is attached to the spirit of fear uh, strong insecurities not not only is it attached to the spirit of rejection a lot of times but most of the time it's attached to the spirit of fear right it, it is that I have strong doubts about me I have things that I don't like about me I'm afraid that someone Someone may not love me. I'm afraid that, that someone may come against me. A strong insecurity sometimes is rooted in the spirit of fear. And, and I can keep going on and on is that um, a lot of times when you are in like a coward-like state, it is attached to to the spirit of fear. So again, when we deal with the spirit of fear, there are many roots to the spirit of fear. If you want scripture, go to 2 Timothy 1 and 7. The Bible says that God says that he did not give you the spirit of fear. So my question is, if God didn't give us fear, where did fear come from? There's only one other entity, and that would be the devil. And so God tells us in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, I did not give you fear. Fear does not come from me. So if you are finding yourself struggling with fear, as I did for a long part of my life, and let me say this. I struggle with fear, not because I opened a million doors. I struggle with fear because there was generational. God showed me generational fear in my family. He showed me where my mother's mother dealt with the spirit of fear. He showed me where I have aunts that deal with the spirit of fear. He showed me where even, you know, my mother and, and my father at times dealt with the spirit of fear. And so it was easy for me to, to deal with the spirit of fear because it has been in my my family for generations, right? Until one day God started dealing with me on fear is not from me. And so if I go back to my childhood, I can remember being in my mom's house or my dad's in their, their apartment because we were in the military, right? I can remember sleeping with the covers over my head because I was afraid of 
the shadows I saw as a child. I can remember we had water bugs and I would sleep with the with the covers so tightly wrapped around me that I would wake up in the in the morning with dripping sweat. The spirit of fear was already being cultivated in me as a child. I remember as an adult and I, I'm, I don't have no problem exposing me if it's going to help someone get delivered. I can remember I got saved at 16 right in Colleen, Texas. I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I moved to Dallas. I went to college and I can remember dealing with the spirit of fear when I graduated college. I was 19. I was actually 18, right? Turning 19. I can remember, uh, no, I was 19 turning 20. I remember graduating college because I started at 16. And I remember when I got my apartment, I struggled with the spirit of fear. The spirit of fear was so strong in my life. And I'm going to tell you how demonic spirits work because the spirit of fear is a demon and, and it comes from the enemy, the devil. I remember being in my apartment by by myself as a 23 year old, 24 year old, and I would come home and I would be afraid of being in the apartment by myself because the spirit of fear had manifested so strong. Because I'm telling you, I dealt with fear from when I was a child all the way as an adult. I didn't deal with it. I never tried to get deliverance. I never tried anything. And so as a 23 year old, I was sleeping with the light on. I I'm just going to expose me. Maybe that's not your story. I'm just going to give you Angela McGill story. As a 24 year old, I was sleeping under the covers because I was afraid. And I'm going to tell you how strong the spirit of fear manifested in my life. I would get up in the middle of the night because I would hear pots clanging in my kitchen. And what was happening is, is demonic spirits were manifesting and they were making noise in my apartment. I can remember, and I'm just going to give you my personal testimony. Maybe your spirit of fear, what you deal with is not this strong, but I'm going to tell you how it can manifest if you don't deal with the spirit of fear, if you don't evict it according to the word of God. And so I remember sometimes I would come home and, and I would, I would, I would put my keys on the fireplace and I would go in my room and start praying and I would hear all this noise in my apartment and I would come back out and my keys would be off the fireplace mantle and they would be in the kitchen, a demonic spirit move my seat. See, we don't, we don't, people don't like hearing this because they believe that demons ain't real and, and, and demons can't do that. Yes, they can. And so my keys would physically move. What was the enemy trying to do? He was trying to make sure I never got free from the spirit of fear because the spirit of fear turned into terror where I was being terrorized in my own apartment. As a grown woman, I could not sleep at night because there was such a strong level of fear in my apartment. I remember I had a friend at that time that I would ask her to come pray at my apartment and one day she was like, Angela, you have the same Holy Ghost that I have. You can pray in your own apartment. But I was like, no, I, I don't have the power that you have. Well, when I pray, uh, the spirit of fear doesn't leave. And she was like, you have the same Holy Ghost. The issue is you're doubting it and because you're doubting it, the enemy is winning because you don't know the God that you serve. You don't know the power of the Holy Spirit within you. And so what am I saying this morning is that spirit of fear does not come from God. Let's just look at 2 Timothy 1 and 7. Then jump over to Luke 10 and 19. The Bible says that God is giving you power. The Bible actually says if you jump up a few verses, it says that the 70 had came back rejoicing to Jesus. And they were like, Master, Master, even the demons uh, 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 obey us, right? Even the demons have to be subject to us because we're, we're using your name, right? We're going out of your authority and power. And, and Jesus says, listen, in Luke 10, 10, 19, he says, I have given you power to tread at, over all the power of the enemy. He says, tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of of the of the enemy. And so my question is, if we use 2 Timothy 1 and 7, and then we use Luke 10, 19, if God has given you, if the spirit of fear does not come from God and it comes from the devil, and then Jesus tells us in Luke 10, 19, I have given you power over all the power of the 
the enemy, then why is it that we still struggle with the spirit of fear? Why is it that we still struggle with anxiety? Why is it that we still, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you something. Heart attacks are, are a lot of times rooted in the spirit of fear. A lot of times when we have strong levels of fear and anxiety, it puts stress on our heart. I have, I have, I've researched this. I have looked it up not only medically, but spiritually. A lot of times the effects on our heart come from dealing with the spirit of fear and stress and, and afraid of what's going to happen or trying to take on all the stress yourself because you have a fear of trusting God a hundred percent. And I'm going to just lay that right there this morning. And so what happens is the enemy wants the spirit of fear to run rampant in the body of Christ. He wants Christians to be Christians, but they, they struggle with the spirit of fear. And the reason being is because if I struggle with the spirit of fear, then it is hard for me to trust God. It is hard for me to believe in who God says he is if I struggle with strong fear. With strong with the spirit of fear. I've seen this when it comes to money, where people have a hard time paying their tithes, paying their uh, offerings, not because God commanded you to do so, no, because you love Him and you trust Him when it comes to your finances. I've seen people not give because they struggle with the spirit of fear. Not that they're afraid to sleep at night, but they're afraid to trust God with their money. So they hold on to all their dollars like this. The issue is when I hold on to my money like this. God can't give you. God can't entrust you with more because you don't trust him with the five dollars that you have. He can't give you hundreds or thousands or, or millions because you're holding so tight to the five dollars. One of the things I want to encourage you this morning is whatever you struggle with the spirit of fear, you've got to allow uh, the Lord into that area so he can teach you to trust him. If it's the business, if it's money, if it's different things, you got to trust God with it. Again, if we go back to Luke 10, 19, God has given you power. If you are a born again believer of Jesus Christ, meaning you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have prayed the prayer for, uh, and you have repented and you have asked the Lord Jesus to live in your heart and to guide your life, right? You have asked him to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You are a born again believer of Jesus Christ. Then, according to Luke 10, 19, because he wasn't talking to unbelievers, he was talking to believers. Believers, God has given you power over all the power of the enemy. Now, whether you realize it or not, whether you realize the authority and the power that God has given you, that's a whole different subject. But God has given you authority over all the power of the enemy. And the Bible goes on to say, and nothing shall by any means harm you. The enemy is like, I say this all the time. He's like a dog on a leash, right? He has a big bark. Right? He has a big bark, but he's on a leash. The enemy can only do what we give him permission to do in our lives. And so a lot of times when it comes to the spirit of fear, it opens the door to many other things. And anxiety, paranoia, double-mindedness, cowardness, all of that comes because you have opened the door. I want you to think about that as a physical door. The enemy is standing on the other side of it. But as a believer, you have power over the enemy and every demonic spirit. But if you willingly go over there and open that door, then the spirit of fear comes in your life and it does not leave until you tell it to go and invite God in so he can break it completely off of your life once and for all. That's what I want to talk about. At 31 I got to a place where I was sick and tired of dealing with the spirit of fear. Not only was I sick and tired of it in my own life, I was tired of it when it came to my family. I was tired of it when it came to my mother. I was tired of it seeing it with, some, with, with my aunt, right? And so what happen is, I, I remember um, studying the Bible on who I am. I remember studying on the authority and the power that God has given me. And I remember there was a holy boldness that came up in me. And as I got to that place, I was like, no, the spirit of fear has to go. And I remember the night that I prayed, God, I, I repent for allowing the spirit of fear in. And I renounce 
any authority or power that I've given to the spirit of fear. And I command not only the spirit of fear, but anxiety and paranoia and everything else that is attached to the spirit of fear to go in the name of Jesus. And then I ask the Lord to come in and completely break it off my life. And then I ask the Holy Spirit to fill the places where the spirit of fear had laid dormant, where it was, right? As, as fear left, now the Holy Spirit needs to fill those rooms, those places where fear has dealt. Many people don't teach spiritual warfare. They don't teach things like this. They don't teach what, what it's like to uh, evict demons from your life. Um, but a lot of times we have Christian believers that are oppressed because willingly or unwillingly, maybe you are not cognizant of it, but you open the door to different spirits. And you can be a believer or born again believer and oppressed by the devil. Just jump in your Bible New Testament. There were people that were, were believers, but they were oppressed by the devil. Why? Because you can open the door to different spirits. And then you have the right to slam the door on those same spirits. But you've got to know your Bible and you've got to know the authority and the power that the Father gives you. If you don't know it, then you will stay in fear. I know there's people that, that won't even launch a business because they're so afraid of my dad failed at this. My mom failed at this. My granny, my great grandpa, my pa, 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 failed at this. And so I, I want to do it, but I'm afraid, right? And, and there are people that have a fear of dying. That is the spirit of fear. Uh, and they don't even, I know people that don't even want to talk about dying because they have embraced the spirit of fear so bad in this area area that they think if I, now listen to this, they think if I don't talk about it, it'll never happen. No, just go back to Job. The Bible says, Job says, the greatest thing that I fear has come upon me. Why? Because when things are not uncovered and you just leave them lying dormant, the enemy will manifest the spirit of fear and then he'll take that same fear and cause you to have a heart attack. Because again, with the spirit of fear, there's a large attack on your heart. And so I want to push you this morning is to deal with whatever area you have the spirit of fear. Wherever you're finding yourself where you're afraid or, 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 or you're skeptical or you're doubting, those are areas where you want to evict the spirit of fear and you want to allow the Holy Spirit to fill those places. If you have a fear of death, you have to deal with it. That doesn't mean that you don't talk about it and, oh, it's not going to happen. No. What will happen is every time you go to a hospital, you'll be afraid that you're going to die. Every time you take medicine or, or, or you, you're starting to have trouble breathing, all of a sudden the enemy will be in your ears like, oh, you're going to die. Oh, I know because I dealt with it. Uh, many of you know my testimony that I was sick and God healed me of a brain issue, right? What happened after that is I still dealt with different levels of inflammation in my body. So God healed my brain. I wrote a book about me becoming a miracle, but, but after that I've dealt with different levels of pain in my body. As I've dealt with different levels of pain, how the enemy is trying to manifest the spirit of fear is he's trying to make me feel like when, when the pain comes, oh, you're going to die. Oh, oh, something's going to happen. Oh, you're not going to live. Oh, oh, and the reason he does that is because he wants me to physically open the door again to the spirit of fear. And, and I've asked God to make me aware of when the spirit of fear is trying to come back. Why? Because generationally it has been in my family. And, and, and God used me to break it off my family. And then what the enemy, he's not happy about that. So what he tries to do is he tries to bring it back in different avenues. Remember, it's not him having the power. It's that if you are a believer, you have the power. And what he tries to do is to get you to open the door to the spirit of fear. Why? Because if you open the door, the fear comes back in like a flood. And so what I'm trying to teach you this morning is that fear is not from God. And if you have fear in any area of your life, see, when people hear this, they'll be like, oh, this is just so simplistic. Right, but are you walking it out? Because you don't need great mystery mysteries of the Bible. You don't need somebody to preach you happy. You need the truth so you can walk it out and you can be free. One of the things as believers is we should be ever growing. 
If you have found yourself being stagnant, it's not God, it's you. Something is wrong because we should be growing. But a lot of times, depending on how long you've been in church, what you like is for someone to tickle your fancy. You want to hear a good, good word so you can post it and be like, man, they shouted me happy. You can be like, I shouted all over the church, right? But when you get up from that shout, right, you fell all out in the spirit. And when you get up and you wipe your mouth and you get your makeup together or for the fellas, you get up, you pull your pants up, right? You didn't have a good shout at church um, on Monday. Can you walk out the word that you heard? Or is it that you have forgotten the word by the time you got in your car? See, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to push people to grow. I'm trying to build leaders, not just people that talk the talk, but I'm trying to grow people up in the body so that you can be a mature believer, not just talking it. And then by the time Wednesday comes, we think you're schizophrenic because Sunday you was happy and you posted all the little shout videos and you posted all the little sermons. But by Wednesday, you're suicidal. Something is wrong. If you've heard the word on Sunday and by Wednesday you're already suicidal, then something is wrong in your life. See, we've got to grow people up. And I'm challenging leaders. We've got to grow people up in the body of Christ. People want to be spoon fed. They want a pacifier and they want a bottle and they want to lay in the pastor's lap. No, the same power that he has, you have the same Holy Ghost in you. And you've got to get to a place where people don't have to come pray in your house. Where you can rise up, take authority over the atmosphere in your house, over the atmosphere in your house. And, and you can change it because that same power lies within you. But the issue is, if you lack knowledge, then it's no good to have the power if you're not unlocking the power. See, with the spirit of fear, what the enemy likes to do is he likes to tell people to throw a blanket over it and hope it disappears. But I, I hate to tell you this morning, is the spirit of fear is not going to leave like that. You have to actually deal with the spirit of fear. It is not, you can throw the blanket it over it. You can be like, I'm never going to talk to my wife about it. I'm never going to talk to my husband. I'm not going to tell my best friend that I'm really struggling with this. You can do all of that. But when you get by yourself, that spirit of fear, it's a nagger. It's a terrorizer. And so what it does is it's all right here. And the enemy is constantly telling you like, oh, you're going to die. Oh, you're going to have a heart attack. Oh, you're never going to bust out of this poverty cycle. Oh, you're always going to be broke. Your daddy was broke. Your mama was broke, you're going to be broke, right? And so the spirit of fear, it tries to get you to a place where I don't even trust God with that which is closest to my heart. Right? I don't I don't trust God with my money. I don't I don't trust God with my family. So what happens is you start trying to hustle, trying to protect your family, and, and you're just digging a hole. You still can't get out of it. Because as a believer, your trust has to be in the Father, and the Father brings increase. Not you. You trust him, he brings increase. Not you hold on to every little bit of money you have. And I don't know why I'm teaching on money this morning, but I want you to see the enemy wants you to be afraid to trust God with your money. And so people start holding so tight to it because they're like, I can't give five dollars because I need these five dollars. No, but you don't know if you would open your hands and give God the five dollars, God could put more money in your hands. But if you don't trust him, then the father can't put more money in your hands because you're so stingy with the money he's already given you. See, your check is not your check. He blessed you with that check. He blessed you with that job. He blessed you with that unemployment. Employment. I don't know where people think that, that it was themselves. Now, unless you lie it when it comes to the unemployment, then maybe you created your own blessing. But I'm talking about people where you know you shouldn't have got this, or you know that check shouldn't have showed up, or you know you could have lost your job during COVID. But but maybe the father protected you. And now you and now you're trying to hold that check and you're like, no nah, God, I can't I can't trust you with these three dollars. I, I can't trust you with this hundred dollar tie. I can't I can't give my ties right. Right now, uh, God know. See, and, and we like to use this lame excuse, like the Father knows my heart. Yeah, He knows your heart. And the Bible says the heart above all things is desperately wicked. So God know your heart, and He know your heart is filthy. That's why He wants you to trust Him when it comes to your money. Stop being so stingy and give, and watch the Father give back to you. I am a believer in giving. There have been times where the enemy has slipped me up, right? Where He's got me not to. 
Don't pay your tithes. You need that little 150. You need that little 500 dollars. And, and what's happened? It's not that God needs the money. Get that. Get that out of your head. God don't need your money. What it is is He's testing your heart. See, He's trying to see is money more important than He is. So what the enemy does is with the spirit of fear, he'll have you, he'll have you hold it so tight to your stuff. And maybe it's not money. Maybe your issue is not money. Maybe you're paying your tithes, giving offering, and your issue is not money. Maybe your issue is people. Like, like maybe you're holding on to your family so tight because you're afraid to put your wife, put your husband, put your friends, put your mother, put your father in the hands of the father. Put your relationship status, woo, in the hands of the father. Maybe you're afraid because you think I gotta get on every dating app that's out there. I gotta, I gotta take care of my family. I gotta, you know, what that says is God, I don't trust you. What that says is God, I know you want to do something, but I got it. I know, I know you want to draw the right husband and the right wife, but God, I got it. Don't worry about it, Father. I'm gonna jump on this dating app. I'm gonna jump on this app. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this. And I'm not, not nothing's wrong with dating apps, but I'm saying, do you trust the Father? See, I know you're getting older, right? For for I'm, I'm 38, still not married. I know you're getting older. What the enemy starts doing with the spirit of fear is he starts making you think, oh, oh, you're gonna be 40. Oh, oh, you're gonna be 45. I mean, how many 50 year olds get married? I mean, how many 50 year olds have children? See, he starts pumping all of this fear and doubt. And what he don't tell you is if we just go back uh, to Sarah, she was real old when she had a child, right? That's Bible days. We can go to some new stuff where there have been recent people that have given birth, right? Janet Jackson, uh, I mean not Janet Jackson, uh, Jennifer Lopez oh, got, gave birth at an older age. See, it's not impossible. The Bible says it like this, this what's impossible with man is possible with God. God can make you give birth at 50, but it's like, do you trust him or are you still struggling with the spirit of fear? See, the enemy is good at whispering lies and then he gets you, and, and I, I, I tell my God children this, I said, this is how the enemy works. He feeds you lies. Why don't you steal? Why don't you lie? Why don't you, why don't you do this? Be sneaky. And then you know what he does? He'll feed you all the lies. Like, keep your money. Don't trust God with relationships. Don't trust God with your body. You, I mean, you got to make it happen. You're a man. Make it happen. You're a woman. You do it. And then you know what he does? Is he sits back and then he laughs at you while you out there trying to work yourself to death. Then he laughs at you while you jumping in people's DMs, right? Try, try to, trying to create conversation. You know why he laughs? Because you're claiming to be a believer, but yet you don't even trust God when it comes to your relationships. You don't even trust God when it comes to your business. You don't even trust God with the ministry he gave you. See, you're so afraid to trust God that every time you get ready to launch out to do something, you know what he does? He throws the spirit of fear again because he's like, look, nobody has been able to do five things at once. Nobody has been able to start a business like that. You know why he does that? Because he wants to feed you with fear and lies and then he wants to step back and laugh at you now that you're not moving. And then you know what he does is he does what? he did to Job. He goes up and he's got God. Look look down there at your children. Uh, uh, didn't you call them anointed? Didn't you prophesy that they was going to do this and that? And then he's like, but look at them in fear. Look, they don't even trust you. You know why? Because his fight is not really with you. He's really, he really is at war with God. And so he uses you as a vessel. And that's why I'm telling you this morning that you've got to evict the spirit of fear. Part of this fearless series is that part one right here today is we're talking about evicting the spirit of fear. Because God does not want you to live in fear. I don't care what it is. I want you to think about today. Uh, wherever you are, if you're in the car, if you're on the couch, in the bed, tub, toilet, wherever you're at this morning. I'm, I'm not judging you. Wherever you're at. I want you to think about what would your life be like if you didn't deal with fear. I want you to think about that this morning. Is what would your life be like if you didn't struggle with fear? I'm not talking about a lack of wisdom. See, some people can be like, uh, oh, okay, I'm just going to eat whatever. I'm going to be eating pork skins and, and everything else to the day I die. And, and the Lord will take care of my body. No, I'm not talking about lack of wisdom. I'm talking about what would your life be like if you trusted God with your body? 
What would your life be like if you trusted God with your finance? I'm not, I'm not talking about a little bit. I'm talking about all the way trust God. What would your life be like if God is stretching you and he's giving you multiple ministry ideas? He's giving you multiple business ideas. He's telling you to write multiple books. He's telling you to finish that degree. He's giving you so much vision. What would your life be like if you didn't have fear? What would your life be like if you trusted the Father? Would you be another Mark Zuckerberg, right? That launched Facebook and is like a quadrillionaire right now? <laughs> what would your life be like? Uh, uh, would you be like a Bill Gates, right? He, he's like super rich. Would you be like that? Maybe God is giving you a multi-billion dollar idea, but you're so afraid that you're like, God, there's no way I can do this. No, he's not telling you to leave your nine to five right now, but maybe he's trying to get you to perfect your craft, perfect your skill. See, fear will have you like, well, there's no way I can just quit my job. No, I'm not telling you to quit your job, but maybe there's some side things that God's trying to get you to perfect your skill in this area that one day you may be off the nine to five. See, would you, would you be the next, the next TD Jakes, right? If, if maybe you're called to preach, uh, but you're like, there's no way, there's no way I can do that, right? Maybe you would be it if you would just let go of the fear. Maybe you could be the next something. I'm not, I'm not telling you to mimic none of those people. But what I'm saying is God probably has greatness for you. But you're never going to get it unless you are willing to let go of the fear this morning. You're never going to get it unless you're willing to confront the fear this morning. You're never going to get it with secrets and lies. I've never seen, right, right now, so many people have so many secrets, right? It's like they're so afraid to expose their, 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 their darkness. Well, how do you get free if you're never willing to invite someone in to help you get free? How do you get free? I put this on Facebook yesterday. I said, why do we like faking the funk? Why can't you just be honest so God can really help you get free? Why can't you just tell that friend, like, man, I really need you to pray for me so I can get free from, from pornography? Yeah, I said it, right? Why, why can't you be honest? Like, I, I don't want to masturbate, but it keeps happening, and I want to get free from it. Can you touch and agree with me? See, we don't like that. See, I'm an honest preacher. I like to tell honest truths because how do people get free? It's why I can love pretty much anybody. I, I can love you if you're in homosexuality. I can love you if you are masturbating. Why? Because how do you get free unless someone who has been freed is willing to help you get free? So you got to be willing to be honest if you know you're struggling with fear so someone can help you break it off your life. See, I've walked out of fear. And when the enemy comes back, like there was an incident yesterday where the enemy was trying to get me to be afraid of something, right? He was trying to pump this thing. And I remember, I'm not going to give you all the specifics, but I remember yesterday there was a point where I had to get by myself in my bathroom and said, God, I am not going to be afraid. I trust you with my life. And I had to out loud say that because the enemy was trying to make me afraid of a certain something. And I had to remind him that I belong to the father and I trust him with my life. And then I had to remind myself, McGill, get yourself together. <laughs> Girl, you trust the Father. What is wrong with you? Because sometimes people lie. You got to talk to yourself sometimes. I got to be in the bathroom. I'm like, Girl, get yourself together. What's wrong with you? You trust the Father, don't you? You belong to him, right? He's going to take care of you, right? And then I look back at myself and say, yeah, he got you, girl. Come on, you can do it. Why? Because sometimes I got to remind myself that the Father has me. I don't need five witnesses. Sometimes I'm like, David, oh soul, why are thou disquieted with me, within me? You know what David was saying is, what's wrong with you, flesh? Get yourself together. You know what David was saying? Stop being so jacked up. Get yourself together. So sometimes you don't need five people. You just need to get yourself together. All right, I'm almost out of here. Well, I've been talking for 40 minutes, but I want to give you guys scripture because I don't want nobody to be like, I didn't, I didn't read the Bible, right? So I'm going to give you guys scripture this morning, and I'm going to give you four points, and I'm out of here today. So I want to jump in, and many of you are familiar with this story. Uh, this is the story of Elijah where uh, King Ahab is on the scene. And, and King
King Ahab is married to Jezebel. And what's happening is Deuteronomy 28 says that God was going to send a drought upon the land because the kings were going to forsake God and they were going to pull the people into idolatry. So what's happening in 1 Kings 18 is that King Ahab has brought idolatry in by way of his wife. And so it's 450 prophets of Baal and it's 400 prophets of Asherah, right? And, and these people are leading the children of Israel. And, and God sends a prophet in the name of Elijah and Elijah comes and tells the people, hey, you know what? God is not pleased with what y'all down here doing, right? And so Elijah says, you know what? It ain't for the rain. It ain't for, I know that ain't proper grammar. He said, it ain't for the rain. That's what Elijah said. He said, look, it ain't going to be no rain for three years. And you know what? It, it ain't going to be rain again until I say it. Because he was a representative representative of the Father. And so Elijah said, you know what? Ain't going to be no rain for you. I almost said Negroes, but he said, ain't, ain't, ain't going to be no rain for y'all. And the reason that ain't going to be no rain, right, is because y'all down here with idolatry, y'all down here worshiping gods that you shouldn't be. And so Elijah comes in 1 Kings 18 and he tells Ahab, you know what, go ahead and gather your false prophets, gather them all up. And, and he says, it's going to be a showdown. And the real God, Yahweh, is going to come forth. And, and, and Ahab was like, you know what, bro, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get the prophets together. He said, do what you do. Get them all together. He said, and, and we're going to have a showdown. And he said, what's going to happen is, you know, Elijah starts off by saying to the people, he says, how long will you toggle back and forth? Either Yahweh is God or he's not. And the Bible says the people said nothing. They didn't say, see, I would rather, if, you, if you're going to worship a false god, I want you to be bold about it. I want you to be rah rah the same way I'm going to be rah rah about my God. And one of us is a lie. See, I tell people that all the time. You ain't going to convert me to Muslim and all this other stuff because one of us is lying. And I'm sure it's not me. You better be very confident in what you believe. Because when I die, I'm confident that Jesus is God and I know where I'm going. You don't get no repeats. So if you're wrong, you don't get to come back and be like, oops, my bad. I need to serve. It's too late. And so Elijah told the people, he said, look, there's only one God. How long will you battle both to and fro? It's the same thing that's going on right now in America. How long will you worship two gods? Either he is God or, or your money is God. <laughs> Either he is God or your family is your God. Either he is God or maybe your man is your God. Maybe your woman is your God. Maybe your title and your fame is your God. He said, how long will you go between two opinions? Either Yahweh is God or whatever you got going on is God. And the Bible says that the people said nothing in 1 Kings 18. And then Elijah said, you know what? Don't worry about it. Go ahead and get the false prophets. Go and gather them together. Gather them 450 prophets of Baal. Gather them 400 prophets of Asherah. And, and, and let, let, let's, just, let's, just, let's just lay some stuff out. And, and, and this was funny because Baal was known to be the god of weather. He was known to be the god of the sun and the god of storm. And so Elijah said, y'all go ahead and call on Baal. Go ahead, all the prophets. The people jump in if y'all want to. Go ahead and call on Baal. And, and let's lay the water out, right? Let's lay all this out. And, and, and the God that answers by fire, he is God. And so the Bible says that, that all the prophets, all 850 of them, begin to call on uh, uh, all 450 of Baal, right? They begin to call on Baal. They begin to fall down. The Bible says they begin to cut themselves calling on Baal. They begin to, to scream and shout and do all this stuff. See, I'm glad I serve a God <laughs> that I don't have to act, act foolish for him to show up. I don't have to do crazy works for him to show up because I have great relationship with him. He shows up because he's my father, not because 
not doing works, you feel like he's not there. It's because of your lack of intimacy with him. You base your relationship off of works and not off of intimacy. So here we go. He says, you know what? Keep doing it. Elijah starts making fun of him. He's like, maybe y'all need to scream a little louder. One translation says that Elijah says to them, maybe, maybe your God is uh, taking a restroom break. Maybe y'all need to scream a little louder. Maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's out there chilling. So Elijah, like me, had the gift of sarcasm because I believe it's a gift. Um, so he had the gift of sarcasm. And he was, I know, somebody looking in the Bible right now talking about where, where is the gift. It, it's not in there, but it's a gift that the Father gives us, right? All my sarcastic people say hallelujah. All right, so Elijah has the gift of sarcasm. And he's making fun of Baal. And then the Bible says, I know somebody on here like, eh, it's sarcasm ain't a gift. It is. And so Elijah says, you know what? Enough of the foolery. Are y'all done? And the Bible says they went from early morning all the way to noon calling on Baal, but he didn't show up, right? Because he's a false god. And then Elijah says, hey, all y'all fake prophets, <laughs> move out the way and, and, and let a real prophet come forth. And, and the Bible says that Elijah goes ahead and, and he builds this. He, there was an altar that was already built and he just basically resurrects that altar. He lays down uh, the water and, and the wood and he soaks the wood in water three times. Why would he soak it, the, water, the wood in water three times? Because normally if it's soaked in water, it's going to be hard for it to catch on fire, right? And so Elijah, he just proving a point that my God is real God. And so he does all that. And the Bible says that, that they, they did all that stuff for hours. Elijah just gets there and he builds that. And then he says, God, you are God. And I'm paraphrasing. He says, Yahweh, you are God. Now answer me by way of fire and consume this. And within five seconds, the Bible says that God came down in the form of fire and consumed the altar, right? And so Elijah says, proof, ha, 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 see, my God is God. And then he orders execution for all the false prophets. We need more Elijahs today. We need more people that believe God's word for his word. You don't need no rubber tummy tummy. You don't need no massage the shoulders. You don't need someone to give you 5,000 prophecies. You just believe God's word for what it is. You just believe what God has said to you because he said it to you. You don't need no affirmation, reaffirmation, confirmation, another mation, some other mation. No, just believe God's word. For his word, because he said it. We need some 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 Peters to rise up. Maybe you're a little rough. See, I can I can hang with some Peters. Hey, hey, say what you want. Maybe you're a little rough around the edges, but you got the boldness to pick the sword up and cut the man's ear off. I can I can kick it with some Peters. Maybe you're a little rough around the edges, and, and the Holy Spirit gotta help you kind of tame. But I can kick it with some Peters all day long. What I can't kick it with is the fakes and phonies, the people who are talking the talk but not walking it out, the people who got 500 titles but have little power. I, I just can't kick it with you. I, I need some people that that just believe God is God. I need some people that says, you know what? Uh, I, I believe Him so much. I'm willing to do this. I, I believe Him so much. I'm, I'm willing to. Do, I need those kind of people. I, I can't kick it with with the fake folks. I, I'm okay with the Peters. Maybe, maybe the, the ear got to be healed. Uh, but Peter, you got some boldness. See, see, I, I can deal with people who got a little carnality, right? Uh, uh, maybe they flesh just rise every once in a while. I, I can deal with those people. You know what? Because those people tend to jump, tend to get out the boat and walk on the water. Nobody else wanted to get out. <laughs> Nobody else wanted to get on the water and walk towards Jesus, Jesus but Peter. See, everybody wants to focus on the fact that Peter sunk. What about the fact that he actually got out the boat and started walking? See, I can deal with the Peters. Maybe you got a little flesh that, that needs to be calmed down. I know everybody wants the perfect people. I'm okay with the people that got a little flesh uh, and, and because God can work with that. That's easy. Uh, uh, but what he can't work with is if you in doubt and unbelief and you won't get out the boat. How come it was a bunch of people in the boat but only Peter got outside the boat? No, I, I can rock with the Peters. I can rock with the people 
uh, they got some struggles, uh, the Lord can deliver you from that. But 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 if you got unbelief and you sitting on the boat and you cowering and your knees knocking and Jesus saying, "Come on out," and you like, "No, nah, I can't get out that boat, homie." God, see, I can't deal with those folks. I can deal with the Peters because God can deal with your attitude. God can deal with your anger issue. God can deal with all that, Peter. Don't worry about it because you're gonna go on to be a great apostle. See, folks don't want to preach that. Yeah, he 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 started down, and the Bible says he began to sink. But if you go ahead and read the end of the story, Peter became a great apostle. See, God can work with you. You just got a little bit of doubt that he got to help you. Uh, he can deal with that. He went on to be a great apostle. So I can rock with the Peters. What I can't do. It is deal with, with the fakes and phonies that's pretending to be something that they're not. See, you can't get deliverance if, if you're too busy pretending you're already delivered. Ha. You can't get delivered if you're too busy pretending that you're already delivered. Deliverance comes in your honesty. So if you're dealing with the spirit of fear this morning, I want to give you a couple things uh, that I wrote in my notes. Uh, <clears throat> number one is we cannot run we have to be willing to face things, people, and situations, no matter how hard it may be. So if I'm going to be fearless, and I'm going to evict the spirit of fear, I already told you that, that God didn't give us fear according to 2 Timothy 1 and 7. I gave you Luke 10 and 19 that says we have all the power of the enemy. So if I'm going to be fearless, is that I cannot run from things. I have to be willing to face things, people, and situations, no matter how hard it may be. It's not going to disappear because you put a blanket over it. It's not, I'm sorry to bust your bubble. It's not going to disappear because you ignore them. It's not going to disappear because you block them on, on, on social media. You still going to have the thoughts of what they sown in your life. You got to uproot it. They don't just disappear because you're like, I blocked all of them on social media and I'm never dealing with them, right? But you also got to deal with the erroneous seeds that they sown in your life, right? Okay, that's a whole other topic. So the other thing, point number two, is you cannot be silent when it's time to speak. If I'm going to be fearless, then I cannot be silent when it's time to speak. Elijah challenged Israel. Remember he said, uh, you can look at this in verses 21 and 22. He says, how long will you toggle between two opinions? Either Yahweh is God or he's not. So I cannot, if I'm going to be fearless, I cannot be silent when it's time to speak. Some of you struggle. Uh, I'm an extrovert, so I don't have no problem talking to people. I don't have no problem, and I get this really from my mother. I have no problem once I get in the crowd. I can talk to the crowd. I have no problem. If I am silent, it is because I am observing the situation. If I am quiet, it is because I am watching as a seer. I am watching what's going on, right? It's not because I can't talk and I'm shy. It's because I am watching the people. I am watching what's going on. So point number two is you cannot be silent when it's time to speak. Some of you have a hard time speaking up for yourself. You have to break that. That is attached to the spirit of fear. You have a cowardness that comes up when it's time for you to speak. That's not God. You have to break the spirit of fear completely off so that when God puts you in situations where you need to speak, you're not quiet. And number three is if I am going to be fearless, I've got to know that God will give me a boldness and courage to do the things he's called you to do. You'll see that in verse 24. The Bible says Elijah calls the prophets of Baal to the carpet. How could he do that? The same way he stopped it from raining. Even though he knew they needed rain in order for the crops so that they could eat to live. He stopped all of that. Why did he stop it? Because they were worshiping false gods. And it was already promised in Deuteronomy 28. So God would give you the boldness and courage and the strength to do what it is that he's calling you to do. I don't know who this is. But if God is telling you to do something, stop being afraid to leap. Maybe you're comfortable doing one or two things and God is calling you to do four or five things. Stop being a coward and trust the Father. Stop embracing fear. Give that fear to God. I don't care who failed before you. They are not you. And if the Father is releasing steady vision to you, it's because he got you. If God is releasing ideas to you, it's because he has you. He doesn't want you to be afraid 
and in fear. All right, point number four, and I'm almost out of here. Uh, I try to keep this at like an hour. <clears throat> uh, point number four is you've got to take big steps of faith, trusting God. It's not enough to sit back and think about it or just talk about it. It's not enough. Too many people, I, I talk to people every day who are like, one day I'm going to launch the business. One day, one day, Angela, I'm going to write the book. It's in me. I'm like, well, when are you going to do it? If it's in you and he's stirring it up, then you got to start writing somewhere. Maybe just start writing in your phone. I wrote my first book in my phone. Not because I had time to sit down at a laptop. I'm on book number four now. I wrote my first book on my phone because I didn't have enough time to be on my desktop every day. See, you got to start somewhere. You can't just sit back and talk about it. Elijah took a big step of faith when he called them out and then he built the altar. Because if, if God wasn't really God, Elijah would have looked like a fool out there dipping the, the, the wood in water and calling forth on a God who wasn't going to show up. He would have looked just like the prophets of Baal. But he had confidence in his God that when he asked God to answer by fire, God showed up. Why? Because God, a lot of times, he don't have no problem showing up. But he's not going to show up to try to make you look good. He's going to show up to draw people to himself. So God had no problem showing up and answering by fire when it came to Elijah. Why? Because as the people saw it, it brought them to a state of repentance. They realized that they had been worshiping this false God and it caused the false prophets to be executed. See, God ain't got no problem flexing his muscle as long as it's not to try to make you famous. But it's, it's to bring him glory and honor. The Bible says we were created to bring him glory. So God don't have no problem flexing his muscle if it's going to draw people to him. Number five, and I'm ending on this. He says, you've got, uh, number five is if I'm going to be fearless, I've got to be absolutely confident that God is who he says he is in the Bible. You've got to take God's word for what it says. Don't add to it. Don't water it down. You've got to believe the Bible for what it says. I'm going to give you an example. If God says by his stripes you're healed, I don't care if your body is given symptoms like you're sick. You've got to believe God for his word. So it's like, God, maybe right now sickness is prevalent, but I believe you are a healer. Maybe right now I can't move my legs or my arm, but God, I still believe that you are a God that manifests miracles. He says that at first Corinthians 12, it's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is miracles. Why would God give us a gift of miracles and healings if he didn't still want to heal today? He could have just nixed that out of the Bible. I like bringing up 1 Corinthians 12 because it's a gift of the Spirit, which means if I have the Holy Ghost, the Bible says he gives the gifts to whom he wants to. Then part of that is God may manifest the gift of healing and the gift of miracles. So if I have a situation where I need a miracle working God, he is still a God that works miracles. Maybe it hasn't manifested in your life, baby, but don't stop believing him for it. If you're connected to some people that need a miracle, like I am, I am in constant prayer for them. God manifests your miraculous power. Cause them to walk again. Cause them to move their arms again. Cause them to speak again. Heal their heart again. I know that he's a God of the miraculous. So number five is if I'm going to be fearless, then I've got to have absolute confidence. How do I have absolute confidence? I've got to read this word and I've got to believe this word. I've got to hear the word and I've got to believe it. Just like you're hearing the word right now. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and the hearing of the word. And so just like you're hearing the word now, it's building faith within you. But you can't hear this word and then get off this broadcast and then start doubting all throughout the week. No, you've got to fight for it. The enemy is not just going to let you get rid of fear and that's the end of it uh, once and done. Sometimes when you've been dealing with something for a long time, listen to me. When you've been struggling with something for a long time and God frees you, the enemy does. He's like a kid. He don't leave, right? He just come back and he starts trying to, not like a kid, like a fly. He tries to pester you, right? You keep shooing him and he comes back because he's like a pesty fly. He wants to see if you're going to open the door again. So you've got to be.
be willing to fight. We, we need some warriors, man. We got too many loosey-goosey people who, who get in a fight. I don't, I don't know, but I'm going to give my own testimony. Back in the day, your girl used to fight. I, I wasn't no punk. When, when I was in high school, you wasn't just going to say anything to me, right? Now, that was my BC days. Let me just give a disclaimer. <laughs> that was back in the day, but you wasn't just going to say anything to me and get away with it. I was a fighter. Now that I'm saved, God has delivered you, girl. But I'm still a fighter even though I'm saved. No, in the spiritual realm, the enemy is not going to punk me. He is not going to come in my house and cause me to be afraid of being in my own house. You're not going to touch my God children and, and have them afraid to go to sleep at night. No, I ain't, I'm not no punk. I, I, I'm not going to calm down, but 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 you're not going to do that because I'm going to cover them. You're not just going to attack my family and, and think that's it. No, I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to take my fight in prayer. The warrior in me is still there, and I'm going to fight for them. You ain't going to touch my mama. You ain't going to touch my daddy. You ain't going to touch none of them. Why? Because they're covered in the blood, and even if they don't pray for themselves, I am constantly interceding for them. Why? Because as their daughter, one of the honors that I bestow on my parents is that I am praying for them consistently. Right? Honor thy father and mother. Okay, y'all don't hear that. But but one of the things is I am praying for them. You're not, you're not going to touch my sister. You're not going to touch my nieces because I am constantly praying for them. And so we need people that have boldness and courage. Stop rolling over and dying because the enemy touched your finances. Stop rolling over and dying because somebody talked about you. Lord Jesus, where is your backbone? Where is your fight? Who cares? Do you know how many people have talked about me? <laughs> Do you know how many people have come against my ministry? Come against my name? That goes with the call. That's just a part of it. I attribute that to the fact that God has called me to be an apostle in the earth. And so I attribute that to you going to talk about me because it goes with the call. If, if you got that much power to talk about me, that it makes me fold my ministry and tuck tail and run, then something is wrong But what God has called me to do. You ain't got that much power, baby, in the world that you make me tuck tail and run. No, I'm not running from nothing. If God is for me, who can be against me? The Bible says no weapon, no weapon formed against me will prosper. You may form, you may talk the talk, you may come against me, you may indirectly put something on Facebook, you may tell people don't follow me. I don't care what you do. My goal and my mission is to stay focused on the Father. I'm not focused on the haters. Haters do what they do best. They hate. That's what they're good at. And if somebody talking about you makes you roll over and die, I wonder what you had in the first place. If, if somebody talking about you stepping out, walking by faith, makes you want to tuck tail and run, then I wonder what you're made of. I wonder how, how far your roots go. Because if they talk about you and you're able to uproot yourself and run, something is wrong. Your roots don't go very far. I have people come against me all the time. The other day, last week, somebody got on my post and said, God is not God. He's a lie. And they said, the devil is God. And I happily just deleted that post and move on. I don't care what you say. If that's what you believe, you better be very confident in your belief because I am very confident in who I serve. Can't nobody persuade me to switch no religion because I know that Christendom, being a Christian is right. There are too many facts that back it up. There are too many natural things that back it up. And so what I believe, I'm confident in. You better be very confident in what you believe in. So my point is, if what people say got you running, got you Shut down your public page because they made a comment. Baby, what is in you? If, if, if all of a sudden you changing you for them, they got a lot of power over your life. And I would say that even when it comes to relationships. If somebody got the power to shut you down, you have given them too much power. Take it back. If somebody say something and it hurts your little feelings, you have given them too much power.
with an identity crisis because the minute you know who you are, I don't care who come against me. And I'll say this boldly. I don't care who comes against me. It's for God I live and for God I die. You're going to have to take that up with the Father. I'm not even going to give you no time of day. You're going to have to take that up with Him because all I'm doing is trying to do what He called me to do. And you ain't got to believe in it. You ain't got to support it. Move, move around. But, but you're going to have to take that up with the Father. I, I'm just doing what He called me to do. So again, if I'm tying this back to the spirit of fear, if what people are saying is affecting you, you have a fear of people. You have a fear of what they said. So for a long time, I struggled with the fear of failure, right? I was going, 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 right? I, I graduated at 16. Uh, I, I finished my degree, my bachelor's. Uh, I finished my associates at, at, at 17 turning 18. I finished my bachelor's at 19 turning 20. I, by 25, I already had my master's. I was about to go back and get my EDD. And then I realized that I had a fear of failure. So what happened is I kept trying to go, 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 go because I didn't want to be a failure. And God had to deal with me on that. He says, you are struggling with the, with the spirit of fear, but it's attached to the fear of failure. And so I had to allow God to uproot that out of me. So if I go back to school, it's not so I can, I can accomplish things so that I'm not a failure. No. Even when I launched out and did my business uh, two years ago, leveled up leadership, I launched that business doing coaching and mentoring and things like that uh, because God told me to, not because I had 50000 people supporting me. I launched it because God told me. I am very aware of what it is God is saying to Angela McGill. I don't care what nobody's saying. If God said it, I'm going to do it. See, if I build it on what you say, you can come back and change your mind. <laughs> Humans are fallible, right? They, they, one day they like you, one day they don't like you. But if I build it on what God says, according to Matthew, when I build it on the rock, the Bible says that when the storms come, the, 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 the house won't be shaken, right? Because it's built on the rock. Who is the rock? Jesus is the rock, according to the Bible. So I'm not building nothing that God told me to build on people. I'm building it on God. God draws the people. My job is to build it on him. He draws everything that I need. So I pray this morning, I'm going to make sure I didn't forget anything, but I pray this morning that I've said something that has put a fire within you um, that you go back and, and evict fear wherever you're dealing with it at, that you pull up fear wherever, wherever you're dealing with fear. And if God is telling you to launch out and do some things that requires big steps of faith, launch out trusting him. You ain't got to have a million followings. You ain't got to have a million bucks. What, what's better than all of that is if you got him. Because he contains all. Woo, I, I'll preach on this. He contains all of that. I ain't got to have a thousand followers. I ain't got to have $10,000 in my bank account. If I got him, he possesses all that. So all I got to do is have him and he can draw that which I need. See, some of y'all chasing money and chasing people and you need to be chasing him because he possesses all of that. You ain't got to trace him. What you got to do is chase him. Stop chasing him and her and chase him and he possesses everybody and everything. So if you chase Jesus, then he has the power to draw everything else. See, we too busy chasing people. We want we want the pastor to like us. We want the elders. We want the best friend. We want the Starbucks clerk. Some of y'all are people pleasers. You want the Walmart clerk to like you. You want the Target clerk to like you. You want the racetrack clerk to like you. You want him and her to like you. You want the kids to like you And you can't be good parents Because you're too busy trying to make your kids like you No, we gotta break all that people pleasing spirit off of you So that you can just be pleased With the Father loving you Forget people liking you The Father loves you and you're accepted in Him He gives you the spirit of adoption I'm not saying that we don't need people But we need the right people We attach to the wrong people Not everybody But a lot of us attach to the wrong people we got these covenants with people we should have ran from, ran from, but we don't get it until it's too late, right? And now we way over here in La La Land, and it's like, how did I get over here? You got over there because you attract the same type of people. Maybe sit down, get healed, get delivered, get free before you attract somebody else in the same anyways. All right, last couple points that I'm going to just share, and I'm going to end on this. 
Being fearless takes any impossibility that you have and makes it a possibility that will become a reality because you invite God in and all of who he is as God comes in. So I hope that makes sense. I'm going to say it one more time. Being fearless takes any impossibility you have and makes it a possibility that will become a reality because it invites God in and all of who God is steps in. See, I don't have to hustle. I trust the Father. And what He tells me to do, I do. I don't have to hustle for people. I don't have to hustle for money. It's His job to take care of me because I belong to Him and I'm submitted to Him. So He takes care of me. The last thing is our fearless nature comes from us drawing on the strength of the Holy Spirit, which pushes us to walk in faith and draws us to where God is. So if I'm going to be fearless, I have to know that fearless and greatness go hand in hand. But if I'm fearful, fearfulness and mediocrity go hand in hand. People who are fearful usually are mediocre. They don't stretch themselves. They don't push themselves for greater. You know why? Because they're always afraid. It's like Peter in the boat. The person who becomes fearless and evicts the spirit of fear gets off the boat and is willing to walk on the water. The person who is fearful sits there and watches Peter walk on the water. And you know what they do? They develop one or two things. They become a supporter like, yeah, rah, rah, Peter, do your thing. Or they become bitter because they know they should have walked on the water. And then now they're hating on Peter. I've dealt with both in my life. I've dealt with people who are like, you think you're all that? And it's not that I think I'm all that. It's just they have strong insecurities. And because they have strong insecurities, when they see a person doing what they know they're called to do, they, they have nothing but hate to come forth. And I've dealt with people who are supporters. And really, they're supposed to be doing what I'm doing, but they just found themselves great as a supporter. And so I want to push you this morning, is that eradicate, evict every form of fear. Wherever, as we were, ta as I was talking today, wherever you found yourself dealing with the spirit of fear, I pray this morning that you would allow God to evict the spirit of fear according to his word. Right? The Holy Spirit within you is the same power that Jesus released in Acts 2. You have the same Holy Ghost. And according to Luke 10, 19, God is giving you power over the enemy. Stop letting the enemy whisper lies to you. And then you're stuck like Chuck and you don't want to move. No, get around, get around people who are pushers. I am a pusher. Get around people. Now, I can't push all y'all, so don't be sending me 5,000 messages. <laughs> but get around. There are many pushers. Get around people who are pushers that will push you to be all of who God called you to be. That will push you to do all of what God called you to do. We need real covenant relationships. Some of y'all have got these floozy friends. That are not ride or die. Y'all got these floozy friends that are not real covenant relationships. They don't know how to pray for you. They don't know how to fast for you. They don't know how to call down heaven for you. They just like, you like, I'm going through that. Like, All right, bro, I'm praying for you. And you know they ain't really praying. You need new friends. You need people that really pray. Like when people send me inboxes and they're like, can you pray for me? Like right at that moment, I pray for them. Why? Because I believe in the power of prayer. Right? I have a best friend. She prays for me. Why? Because we have a covenant relationship that was blessed by the Father. And so we need real friends. You don't need these fake and phony friends that, that, that ain't going to pray for you, that ain't got your back, ain't going to tell you if, 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 if you smell like poo. You need friends that's going to tell you the truth. See, I'm one of those friends. Don't don't come to me if you don't want to hear the truth, because I'm not I'm not gonna pacify you. I'm gonna tell you the truth. Now I try to I try to work it to where no, nah, sometimes I don't. I just give it to you. Because if you need the truth, you need the truth. Now if you're still in a baby like state, then I might chop it up and give it to you like 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 baby food. But but if you need to be on meat and you still on mashed potatoes, then I'm that person. I'm gonna push you to grow up. You need to be around people like that. They challenge you. But they help you be all of who the Father is calling you to be. So I, I pray this morning that I've said something that has been a blessing to you. I pray that I've said something that has been a strength to you. I pray that something is burning within you, that fire of God that, that is pushing you to, to evict all forms of fear. Don't let fear uh, stay in your life. And if you know somebody that's struggling with fear, like being a coward or double-mindedness or anxiety, paranoia, things like that, share 
share this video with them. I'm telling you, God, I am a living witness. God can break fear off your life. I don't care what levels of fear that you're dealing with. I told y'all, I was dealing with the manifestation of demons in my apartment, banging pots, closing cabinet doors. I would go to sleep and I would hear pots banging. That was the full manifestation of the spirit of fear in my apartment. When I was in my 20s, while the enemy wanted me to be terrorized in my own house. <clears throat> now, I have this running joke that I tell now when I teach on the spirit of fear. How was I paying $900 in rent, $100 in water, another $150 in electricity, and the demon of the spirit of fear was running my house? No, 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 no. If I'm paying the rent, you got to go. You, got, you ain't paying nothing here. So I tell that joke because it's like that's how demons work. You paying the rent on your house and then you letting demons run your house? Oh, no, no, no. Not, not Angela McGee. You got to go. Unless, if you ain't paying no rent, you got to go. So I had to evict the spirit of fear because he, wa he wasn't paying no rent. I was paying the rent. You're not going to make me afraid in my own apartment and you ain't paying no part of the rent. You got to go. And some of y'all are afraid being in your house by yourself. You got a nightlight. You got the blanket over your head. You got sound of the music. You got all this stuff going because you're fearful. You need to evict the spirit of fear about your house. Some of y'all are afraid when it comes to your physical body. The enemy got you thinking you're going to die. Evict the spirit of fear. I don't know where you are. I don't know all of what you got going on. But I'm telling you, I hear this as I'm on this live. Some of you are afraid to die. And the enemy has been bombarding you, making you feel like you're going to die. That is a lie. Everything the enemy says is a lie. All he does is try to get you to believe in it so that you're so afraid that it manifests because of the power within you, not because of his power. So whatever level you're dealing with, I pray that you eradicate it. If you're dealing with fear when it comes to your money, I pray that you trust the father. I'm a witness. I know what it's like. To not pay tithes, offering nothing, because I'm like, God, no, I need this money. And I know what it's like to trust the Father even when it comes to my money. I know what it's like to give and trust God that God got my back. And I know what it's like to make more money than I even needed because I trusted God with my finances. The amount of money, and I'm not going to go into this, but the amount of money I make right now, I shouldn't be making as a 38-year-old. But I make it because I trust God with my finances. I'm not, I'm not. I'm not stingy when it comes to the Father. I have no problem giving. And the times where I have been stingy, I have seen it affect my finances because I didn't trust God. So I want to encourage you this morning, if you're struggling in the area of your finances, you got to trust God. Stop trying to do it yourself. Stop trying to hustle and save $5 here and there. Get that $5 to the Father and trust Him, right? If you can give it to the lottery and everything else, just go ahead and give Him 5 10 and trust Him with that. Amen. So with that, I'm going to share that if, you, if, this, if this ministry this morning has been a blessing to you, then you can give to it. You can sow into this ministry. I'm a firm believer in sowing. You can sow uh, through Cash App. If you have it, it's Wildfire Church. Or you can sow on our website, which is www www.wildfireblazingchurch.com So I'm going to say it again www.wildfireblazingchurch.com You can hit the give tab and you can give that way as well I'm a firm believer if something is feeding you if it is encouraging you if it is a blessing to you you're not you're not sowing it to me personally you're sowing it to the vision that, that God gave me and, and our goal is, is, is to allow God to use individuals to sow and then we launch from just being a virtual ministry to having a physical building as well. But but I'm not rushing to do anything. I'm just letting the Father lead and guide me in everything that I do. I love you guys, man. I pray that every Sunday that you jump on, uh, that this is a blessing to you and it's an encouragement. And that you don't just soak it up for yourself. That you share this broadcast, share this video with multiple people. Not to make Angela McGill famous. That's that's not what it's about. It, it's, it's, it's about drawing people closer to the Father. I want you to hear this and then this week I want you to be challenged to evict the spirit of fear. I want you to be challenged this week to not just go back to doubting and worry. Fight it 
Every time it comes, fight it. If you got to say it out loud, I trust Jesus. I trust the Father. My life is in his hands. The Bible says that you shall live and not die. If you got to fight with that scripture, there are times when the enemy was trying to threaten me with death that I had to profess that scripture over my life, that I will live and not die. The enemy would try to tell me, like, you're going to die in your sleep. You're going to die when you go to the hospital. And I had to fight with that scripture that I shall live and not die. So you got to fight it. When, when you've allowed the enemy to come in, sometimes he don't just walk away easy. you got to fight him. God, you, you, I mean, you evict the spirit of fear, but that doesn't mean he don't come back and try to find an open door. But you got to fight against him. Don't just go back to doubting. Just go back to double-mindedness. Go back to anxiety. you got to fight whatever the enemy is trying to throw your way. So I love you guys. Don't forget to share the video. If it has been a blessing, I'm going to end in prayer. Father, thank you for just being wonderful. Thank you for being God. We thank you that there is nobody that compares to you. God, you are an amazing God. I pray this morning for anyone that's dealing with the spirit of fear this morning. I pray that it will be broken off their lives. If they're dealing with fear when it comes to money, if they're dealing with fear when it comes to their family, if they're dealing with fear when it comes to their body, if they're dealing with fear when it comes to their job, if they're dealing with any manner of fear, paranoia, double-mindedness, God, and anxiety, uh, lack, lack of uh, uh, cowardness, God, I just pray this morning that the spirit of fear will be evicted out of their lives and it will be broken once and for all. I pray for the person who does not know who they are in you, God. They don't know the benefits that come with being a son of God. They don't know the benefits of having their identity in you. I pray this morning that you would open the eyes of their understanding, God. Cause them to know who they are in you as they read the Bible, as they listen to the word, God. Cause them to know who they are in you, God. That they won't let the enemy punk them. That they won't let the enemy have them tossed to and fro. I pray that this morning, God. And I pray that you would give them the boldness and the courage that you gave Joshua. You told Joshua, God, to be strong and courageous. <clears throat> you told him that he was going to possess the land, but you were with him. I pray for the person this morning that you are calling to take a leap of faith, that you are calling to do something they've never done before, that you are calling to step into the unknown. You are calling to blaze a trail that's never been blazed before. You are calling to break poverty up off their life, God. You have called them to be the modern Joshua's to their family, God, where they're going to be different than everyone else in their family. Father, I pray that you would fill them with boldness and courage this morning, that they won't be afraid to take a leap of faith, that they won't be afraid. Uh, thank you, Jesus. They won't be afraid to step out, God, and trust you. I pray for the person that has trusted you and maybe they feel like they have failed. May you give them the courage to trust you again. I pray for the person that said, Angela, I I've tried this before. Father, may you give them the courage to try again trusting you. I pray for the person that's saying, you know what? I, I've sown before into other ministries. I pray that you would give them the courage to trust you again. Not me, but you, Father. I pray that you would draw us all, God, into a deeper relationship with you. May we hear your voice. May we know what it is that you're saying. And Father, I thank you that as we get off of this broadcast, may this word ring in our hearts, God, ring in our ears, God. May next week, when, when they want to embrace fear, may you cause these words that you have had me to speak, Father, to ring in their ears, God, that they will not embrace fear, that they would slam the door shut to all manners of fear. And Father, I thank you for these things this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, A to the man. I love you guys. Don't forget to share the broadcast. Uh, don't forget to sow in the ministry if it's been a blessing to you guys.